Good morning. Good morning. Today is in the church world known as Pentecost Sunday. That's why you see the red. Uh, we've got the colors to reflect Pentecost Sunday, and that's the day that the Holy Spirit came for the church. So we, we think that's a pretty big deal. It was the forming of the church when the church started, and so we try to celebrate that in the church. And so uh, every day since Easter, we've been, it's like the, the Sunday after Easter. So it's, it's a, almost a season of Easter. So well, now we're in Pentecost. It's not exactly a season, but next week will be the Sunday after Pentecost and so on and so forth. Uh, we also have days like Trinity Sunday where the, uh, the uh, color is white. And so uh, you'll, you'll notice those things. There's a reason behind why we do these things. We don't always explain it, but uh, we want to just mention that today. And I think we, uh, William, do we have the prayer of the Holy Spirit? We're going to, we're going to do this uh, today. We may do this uh, throughout the season of Pentecost uh, to welcome the Holy Spirit. Uh, but today I just want to say that uh, we are uh, thankful for the power of the Holy Spirit that comes in our lives that gives us uh, guidance, strength, and power for living uh, the, the Christian life. And we just want to celebrate that today. So if you would, I want, to, I want you to join me in the prayer, and then I think Beth's going to come up and read the lectionary reading for today. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and enjoy His consolation through Christ. Amen. All right. The first lectionary reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God for the people of God. 
Good morning. Good morning. Good to be back. Uh, let us stand and turn to number 393 and sing Spirit of the Living God. standing we're going to turn to page 826 in the hymnal actually on 827 and we're going to do the responsorial reading uh, Psalm 104 let's do verses 24 through 34 and 35b O Lord how manifold are your works in wisdom you have made them all the earth is full of your creation yonder is the sea great and wide Creeping things innumerable are there, living both small and great. There go the ships, and Leviathan whom you form to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditations be pleasing to the Lord in whom I rejoice. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to number 399. Take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take 
my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it mine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour. My feet, its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. Maybe see you. God is good. Oh. And all the time. Oh. This morning for announcements, our Sunday school is always on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and our worship service is at 11 a.m. We have a special congratulations this morning to the newlywed married couple, uh, Hannah and Andrew Fields, who were married last night. Our altar flowers this morning are given in love by the family of Paul Ford to honor his birthday, which is the 25th. <coughs> Excuse me. Wednesday night Bible study, how to share Christ, session five, share the message. Our question for the week is what are some topics you're always ready to talk about? Online Bible studies at 5.30, in-person Bible study is at 6 p.m. Today is our cardboard testimonies near the end of the service, so make sure you stay tuned. Uh, hymn of Promise on the, in our United Methodist hymn on page 707, take time out this week to read the words of this hymn. May activities, uh, we are still collecting money in our baby bottle fundraiser for the APCC. Those are to be turned in on June the 20th. May 5th is our fifth Sunday Methodist home offering. Our West Care, Care Emergency Shelter Drive for May, and some things are listed in the bulletin. June activities, June the 1st, the Methodist Mountain Mission Truck will be here at Salem. The 13th, we're having a celebration service, followed by a potluck dinner. I forgot the sign-up sheet this morning, so it will be here next Sunday. And on the 27th is Salem's Maintenance Fund Offering. Any other announcements this morning? We have a lengthy prayer list that's included in your bulletin. Do we have any spoken prayer requests on your heart this morning? Uh, I remember it's not on the prayer list, but Andy Swanson, uh, of course he's not here today, and Adam is filling in, thank you, uh, Andy's back is down today, so I remember him. Let's remember Andy Swanston, let's remember our pastor's granddaughter Shelly, she was in a little accident yesterday and is in the hospital in Lexington, so let's keep her in our prayers. But we have a praise on that. We're, we're but she's doing better, and we're thankful for that. The surgery went good, and she's in recovery mode now. Yeah. Uh, have plastic surgery, but thank everybody for the prayers, of course. Uh, did we mention, forgive me, uh, the fifth Sunday offering is coming up? Yeah. Did we mention that? Okay. Yeah, next Sunday is the fifth Sunday offering for the Methodist home. If not, we'll ask our pastor to come lead us in prayer. Again, I want to thank everyone for the prayers. For those of you that uh, knew about it and prayed for our granddaughter, uh, she's going to have some a road to recovery with the injuries to her arm are pretty severe, but could have been worse, of course. And we're thanking God for the fact that uh, it looked like the tendons and everything were still intact. So uh, we, we have reason to be praised, uh, to be thankful today. So uh, at this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer. invite you today to just quietly pray and just offer your praise and thanksgiving to God at this time.
confessions to the Lord. Any prayer requests on your heart, prayers for others, offer those to the Lord. this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever amen at this time uh, we're going to ask uh, William to come for an offertory as he makes his way down here uh, I want to thank you for uh, your giving, your faithfulness in giving, just uh, for the fact that uh, in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that you were continued to be faithful in giving. And you know, we haven't passed a plate in, I don't know, how long has it been uh, since the pandemic began? And, uh, and yet our offerings have continued to be steady and, and uh, we're thankful for that because of the many ministries we're able to help. And so we've asked William to, to play today um, just a little something to uh, bless you with and, uh, and just to thank God for. Pray, dear God, we can use this offering to 
bring need in this community to those that need it and the missions, dear God, that we sponsor. I just pray that you can, it can be a blessing to them and they can know that it comes from the heart of the people. God, I do thank you again for what you mean each day in my life and the lives of others. Pray, dear God, that you can just continue to be with us and bring us back together each day. I want to let you know uh, right after the service we'll have a, a really short uh, board meeting. Uh, Paul and Johnny couldn't be here today, but I spoke with him this morning and uh, he and I discussed an issue that we'd like to take up with the board. It'd be about 10 minutes, no more, just one short issue. Our reading this morning comes from John chapter 3. It is Nicodemus visits Jesus. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Those who believe in Him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we might have an understanding of the Scriptures uh, beyond what we might do by earthly means, that we might be filled with Spirit and know the truth and know the light and be drawn to the light, Father. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ron. So there are certain words that, uh, or phrases that conjure up sort of comfortable, like root canal or uh, maybe IRS audit or Louisville Cardinals. I don't know, you know, just throwing that out there. But uh, just words that when you hear that word, you sort of cringe and like, mm -hmm, that's not really something I'm comfortable with. And one of those in the church world, one of the words is evangelism. 
And I think that's because evangelism has been misused and abused on people for so much, so, so long that people are weary about even talking about evangelism. If you're a believer, evangelism kind of conjures up some guilt feelings because you haven't uh, saved the world, you know. Uh, you haven't been there for everybody, and, and so there's fear or inadequacy because I'm not able to do that. Uh, but I've come to believe that true evangelism really is about doing good for other people and just simply letting them know that you care and that somebody else cares, somebody very important that's higher than us, cares about them. And if you can convey that without preaching and uh, judging and all that, then that's a great thing. Uh, and that's, if that's what evangelism is, and I think it is, then I'm all in. I'm all in with this. Uh, in his book, Unchristian, David Kinnaman interviewed hun hundreds of young adults on their perceptions and experiences with Christianity. And one of the things that they talked about was how they felt about evangelism. And most of them, as you might expect, had a negative connotation with evangelism. Most of them felt like that people were being very judgmental. And also, a third of them said that they felt like that the people in their lives that were so-called Christians didn't really care about them. They felt like they were just a project or a target for them. So the question becomes, how do we who are Christians convey the message of Christ to many people who don't want to hear it? Because as Ron read the message, many people don't like the light because the light reveals a few things. How can we do it in such a way that they'll want to come to the light? And I think the best way to do it for me, I think, the best example I could give is the example of Christ. What better teacher or master to learn from than Jesus himself? He was a wonderful communicator, and he was able to evangelize, evangelize or present the gospel in a way that was non-threatening, non-judgmental, and a very loving and conversational way. So let's look at the example of Christ, and we've all probably... I would assume most of us have seen or experienced the negative side of evangelism. I know people who every time they go to uh, the restaurant or whatever, they're, they're trying to get the waitress saved and they're aggravating people. And, and I think there's been, you know, when I first started my Christian life, I did some of that myself. I thought that was what I was supposed to do. And uh, I, I don't do that so much anymore. I have found, and this is what I have learned, and I want to share this with you today if you don't hear anything else, is that if God is working in someone's life, you will find that, that you will know it if you're dealing with that person and if God calls you to deal with that person. I don't think it's my job to save the world. I, I, I don't want that pressure. And I don't think God is putting that pressure on me. I think there are certain people that I cannot win and that it's not my responsibility to win, but there will be some people that God places in my path that I will and can have an effect on, and those are the people I want to reach. I want God to help me, to enlighten me to see those people. So I have learned as, as a chaplain, for example, I go around to the hospital room, and I don't go up to people and say, hey, if you died today, would you go to heaven? That's probably not something you want to start out with in the hospital, you know, uh, as a chaplain, because they're already nervous. They're in there. They don't half the time know what all is wrong with them. They're having tests done. And if you walk up and say, are you ready to die? It's probably not a good way to start a conversation. So what I have found is this. As I am in conversation with people, it usually will come up in some way in the conversation. Either they will bring it up or the Holy Spirit will reveal that they are dealing with something that they really need to go a little deeper with. And so what we do is we go a little deeper and find out what their needs are. But it's not something that you force on people. You can't force it. God doesn't force it. God doesn't push us and pressure us. He brings us to him by his wonderful mercies and grace and through the Holy Spirit. So if he doesn't do it, why should we? And so I'm just going to encourage you today to, uh, to allow 
the actions of Jesus to speak for us. And so first of all, that's what I want to start out. The first thing we want to do in evangelism is let our actions speak first. Amen? Let our actions speak first. Yesterday we had the um, conference, United Methodist Conference, the, the bishop, Bishop Fairley, speak. And it, this was online. It was a Zoom and so in the middle of everything going on with my granddaughter and the wedding uh, and Sandy's family uh, aunt coming in for her 80th birthday came in to visit, uh, I'm trying to do a Zoom call with the bishop. And uh, I wasn't the only one. It was for all the clergy of, of Kentucky, really. And uh, I could have said I, I just got too much to do, and I'm sure they would have understood. but. I was able to, to do that uh, with my phone, thank God for technology or I wouldn't have been able to do it. But uh, one of the things he talked about was how moved he was when he came in different churches, little churches in Kentucky that were doing things for people affected by the flood. And I know he came to Prestonburg and uh, there's a video that we may show sometime that Samantha is doing an extensive uh, interview uh, talking about some of the things they did in, in Floyd County. And he was just talking about how moved he was by the people of the United Methodist Church being the hands and feet of Christ. And what I'm saying is a lot of times people won't be impressed with how, how much you know the Bible. You know the old saying, you don't, how much you know is how much you care. They won't be impressed with that. But when they see people giving and donating and working, giving of their time and all that, that moves people. I believe our actions ought to speak before anything else. This morning, you may notice that Beth is not in the service. She's not in the service because she's downstairs with Vanessa's little sister taking care of her. Now, that is allowing Vanessa to be in the church service today. Now, I... I know it would be easy to say, you know what, that's not my child. I've got my child raised. I don't have to do that. But I can remember a time in my life when I went to a church and I had a little noisy boy that wouldn't shut up, Bruce. And, and he was just driving us crazy. And it was the first time I ever went to that church. And the lady come up and, and I, I knew the lady or, you know, I was comfortable with it and said, can I take the child for a few minutes? And, and she did. And you know what? I went back to that church because of her actions. I didn't remember anything to preach or preach. I wasn't particularly impressed with that. But because the love that they showed me that day with that child meant something to me. So what I'm saying is our actions speak louder than words. And sometimes uh, the fellow in the nursing home the other day when we were ministering over our uh, was talking about the fact he said he said uh, sometimes you have to say I can't hear you because your actions are speaking louder than your words so we have to remember that uh, let's look at a couple of the verses there in John there as he said now there was a Pharisee a man named Nicodemus who was a leader of the Jews he came to Jesus at night and said Rabbi we know that you're a teacher who has come from God for no one could do these signs you do apart from the presence of God so he saw the signs that Jesus did and it spoke to him now Nicodemus was a good man he was a religious man he was involved in religious activities and du duties but he said that he saw something in Jesus that spoke to him. And I want to say that it was more than just the miracles that Jesus did, but it was the compassion and the love behind why he did what he did. I remember a preacher one time that uh, was kind of known for really letting it all out there. And, and every once in a while you hurt people's feelings. I've done that too. Uh, you know, I, I know sometimes you say it and you can't take it back, but... Uh, but I don't think he, he apologized for anything he said. But anyway, one day he was just letting them have it and preaching and preaching as hard as he could. And, and after the service, people would walk up to him and speak to him. And he said, there was a lady in the back of the line, and he said, I could tell she was furious. And she was just as mad as she could be. And uh, so she waited, got up there, and, and he said by the time she got up there, her demeanor had changed a little bit. And she said... I'm going to tell you right now, I was ready to let you have it for what you said today. But then I saw that little moist spot. 
in the corner of your eye. And I knew that you loved me. And I think sometimes, you know, we can say the message, we can live the life, whatever, but when people see that we really care, and they see that moist spot in the corner of our eye, then the message will make much more sense to them. And I think it's important that we understand that, that Jesus didn't go into Nicodemus just pounding away that, you know, on, on a canned presentation. He really was seeing something in Jesus' life that he wanted. The compassion and the love that, that moved him to help people was something that Nicodemus didn't know anything about. And he said, I saw the signs that you did, and I know that you're a teacher from God. And there was something about Jesus that moved him, that he wanted what he had. Not necessarily the miracles, but the compassion. It's kind of like the same thing with John Wesley. When he saw the Moravians and the ship was about to go down, he saw that they were not afraid. And he said, I want what they have. It was the same thing with me when I watched my mother in, a, in her life, as I mentioned before, and the toils of life, and when everything was turned upside down in her life, and a person that I can't imagine how she would have any peace or any happiness, and yet she did. And there come a time in my life, and I said, I want that. I want that too. And what I'm saying today, that your actions will speak louder than your words ever will. And we need to let that happen first. Jesus performed miracles, uh, and he did all these things, but his actions spoke louder than words. Now, so let me ask you a, a, an important question. Is there something about you and your life that prompts other people to say, yeah, I see something different in this person. I see something changed in this person in the way they were before. I want what they have. There's something about it that would cause them to come to know that, that they see something in us. You know, I can't turn the water into wine unless you count that little trick I did, you know, uh, around Easter. Uh, but I, I can't do that. So I'm not going to impress people with miracles and all that. And you can't either. But the gospel is both proclamation and demonstration. And the thing is, people will probably not be moved by your good things. Like, you know, sometimes there was a time when, when uh, you know, not cussing and, and doing all those things impress people. But I think more and more today, those don't move people and they don't cause people to knock on your door and say, tell me something about Jesus. But when they see you do a random act of kindness, when they see that you sacrifice them for them or help them have a meal or whatever, that will move people. And so evangelism first is actions and not words. And so let us actions speak first today. Um, I was reading, this was an article uh, just came out uh, recently, I think, uh, in the Washington Journal and, and some other articles. But I first heard it on a podcast and I, and I was uh, looking at this uh, just the other day. But a lady by the name of Latonya Young, Latonya Young and David Esch. Latonya was an Uber driver and she was working extra, an extra job. She was a hairstylist by day and an Uber driver by night, trying to make it in this life. When an encounter with a man who was fairly wealthy changed her life. When he got in the car, they began to talk and he found out that she was actually uh, working these two jobs to try to try to get back into school. You see, when she was 16 years old, she had to drop out of high school because she had a child. And so uh, she said, I'll put, put my dream off, and finally she was able to go on and, and, and finish that degree. And she actually entered into college, but in 2011 she had to drop out of college because she had a bill of like $700 that she just couldn't pay. She said, every time I wanted to be able to, to pay that and I had money to pay it, something would happen, my child would need it, so I just couldn't do it. The interesting thing about this story is he was moved by this conversation, just being an, an Uber passenger, that when he found out about, he got the information about the college, he went to that college personally and paid off that $700 debt for her and then told them, and they called her up and said, you're now clear to enroll in the school. And Latanya actually did that. She said, after somebody did something like that for me, I, I wanted to do well. 
And so I enrolled in, in, in college, and she uh, just recently got her associate's degree. And guess what? Uh, this man was there, Mr. Esch was there to uh, see her walk across the stage. And they actually, uh, I think we have a picture of them here, Latanya Young and Kevin Esch. And this was her graduation. And uh, he was there to see that. And so she said uh, she's also enrolling and in going to in complete her, get her bachelor's degree, uh, in her, her associate's in criminal justice, by the way. And she wants to get her bachelor's degree and become a lawyer. And he was there to be a part of that. And she said, my life was changed that day because of what this one man did. I'm just saying today, we can't all pay someone to be able to understand that. We don't have that kind of money. And, you know, but we can buy somebody's lunch. You know, we can, we can help someone out in, in that way or take them a meal or something like that. There are things that we can do that can speak volumes to people. So actions first. Secondly, engage people in real conversations. Talk to people. I made the mistake when I first started and I, I took an evangelism course of doing these canned presentations. Now, a couple weeks ago, I shared with you evangelism explosion, and there's a Romans road. There's different ones that people learn, and it's good to learn those, to be familiar with the gospel. But when you're talking to people, don't take a canned presentation to them. Talk to them as people. I learned this the hard way because I, I, I felt like that I was just simply, they were a project. And they felt that way too, I'm sure. And maybe sometimes they, they profess just to shut me up. I don't know. But what I've learned is that you just treat people like people. That's what Jesus did. He engaged Nicodemus in a conversation. He didn't walk in there and tell him the four spiritual laws. He didn't take him down the Romans road or evangelism explosion. He just simply talked to him, engaged him in conversation, got to know him a little bit. And we find this also in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. Jesus does the same thing. He begins to talk to her about a drink of water. Understand that evangelism is just simply caring about somebody. And they'll know if you truly, truly care. So there's a give and forth, back and forth. And so eventually, you know, Nicodemus comes in with a question. And asks him, you know, how can I have this, this thing? And, and that's when Jesus replies uh, in, in verse 3. Look at the verse there. Very, tru very, very, very truly, I tell you, no one can come, can see the kingdom of God without being born from above or born again. Now, most of us are familiar with that expression. We've heard it before. Uh, the term born again. Uh, could also mean born from above. That's what uh, our NRSV text that we read today, uh, most scholars suggest that is the actual, you know, transliteration of that word is born from above. But Nic Nicodemus understood Jesus as saying, you're going to have to be born again. You're going to have to be born again. He's like, how am I going to do that? I'm an old man. And how am I going to enter my mother's womb and do all that whole process again? He didn't understand, which tells us, that we need to realize that people may not understand all the religious jargon we use, so we have to kind of bring it to their level. Y'all remember, uh, I may have told that before about the fellow one time went up as witness and guy and said, hey, you ready for the judgment day? And he's like, I don't know, when is it? He's like, I don't know, could be today, could be tomorrow. He said, well, you let me know when it is, my wife will probably want to go, you know. So people don't always understand us when we use religious terms that we're familiar with. When you talk about have you been born again, it's a political thing sometimes, but some people don't know what you're talking about. So we have to break it down in, in the conversation and talk about that. Uh, Paul Borthwick has written a helpful book on this subject, and it's, it's called Stop Witnessing and Start Loving. I think that's an interesting title. Uh, so, you know, sharing our faith isn't about delivering a speech or making a sales pitch. It really is about conversation with people. It's as much about listening as it is talking. Uh, Todd Hunter is a former president of Alpha USA, and he has, I guess he's something of a specialist in this area. 
And this is what J Jesus, he said, did with Nicodemus when he really began a conversation with him. And in chapter 4, as I mentioned, the woman at the well. And you know, that takes the pressure off for me. I don't know about you. When I realize I don't have to memorize the whole Bible, when I'm just caring for people and talking to people and telling people, hey, you know, I, I, I just want you to know that I'm here if you need anything. That's evangelizing, is it not? It's part of, of the gospel. And, and you don't always have to be preaching to do that. Um, so if you're looking for a conversation starter, I wouldn't recommend saying, you know, are you ready to die or have you been born again? But a lot of times uh, as a chaplain, I'll ask things like, what is your relig religious background? Tell me something about your religious background. Uh, has there been a time in your life when you felt close to God? Something like that. Or do you have a community of believers that support you? Uh, what's your impression of church or Christianity? Those questions people are always, most of the time, ready to answer. And it doesn't feel threatening. So let our actions speak louder than words and engage people in real conversation. But sooner or later, the message, what we call the gospel, it will come around to that. And that's called the good news. So the third principle I find in this passage is tell God's story. To simply tell God's story. So by the time we get to verse 16, there's a subtle shift in the passage. And they're going now, he gets into the heart of the matter. Notice what he says in verse 16, most loved and familiar verse in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the King James, y'all can say it with me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the message which is the heart of the gospel. But notice he didn't go there first. It took a while for him to get to that point. And he wanted to reiterate that God loved the world. That it wasn't God's will to condemn the world. And those words caught Nicodemus by surprise, I think. Because I think Nicodemus was a lot like a lot of us growing up. We didn't really believe God loved us, uh, you know, because we, we felt like God is this great killjoy in the sky that just wants to take all the pleasure of life away. And then we realized one day, God really does love me. God really does want a relationship with me. He wants what is best for my life. He's not up there. He's not out to get me. And that's a very important point, that we just share God's story. This is what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary, and this is what he did for me as well. Um, so maybe people don't know that about God. I, I was talking to a school teacher one day, former, she's a retired school teacher, but she ended up in the hospital and was having a hard time. And they were trying to get an IV. And, you know, sometimes people's veins are more challenging than others. I haven't had pretty good veins for that, but she didn't. And they were having a real hard time getting an IV. And she said, uh, they said, wait a minute. We got somebody to do this. And in walks a young man. And when she looked at him, she realized that was one of her students from like fifth or sixth grade walking into the room and immediately recognized who she was. And he was able to get that IV in, no problem. And she said, I tell people all the time, I tell my teachers all the time, you better be good to those little children because they're not going to be little children forever. <laughs> one of these days they may grow up and be the one taking care of you in the hospital. And so we have to understand that there are people in this life, and this woman is, is a wonderful person too who gave so much to others. But understand that there's a, a conversation that came to an end, and then Jesus lets Nicodemus walk away. So here's the thing. Nicodemus walks away and could have rejected Jesus. And that would have been the end of the story. It was his choice, right? It was his choice. But we know the rest of the story. Later in the story, Nicodemus shows up again to argue uh, with the Pharisees and, and the relig religious leaders to give Jesus a fair hearing. And then at the end, he's the one that takes Jesus' body down and allows it to be buried in the tomb. So what I'm saying is, Nicodemus, it took some time to sink in, but eventually he was born again. And so that's what we have to do, is at this point we just sow the seed, let God do the rest. It's not up to us to make sure that it, it takes root. We sow the seed. 
God does it. Amen. So here's one of the ways we're going to share our testimony today is with our cardboard testimonies. At this time, I'm going to ask everyone who's going to participate to just line up over here with your cardboards. And we're going to share this. And while we're doing this, I'm going to sing a song. So give me just a minute to get the guitar and get ready. Sandy, you want to start them out sure. first? Uh, so let me start first. And, and what we're doing is we're just simply sharing something God has done for us today. So here's mine. Y'all join me if you want. We're going to sing. Pass it on. as we get the acolyte to take out the light today. And I invite you to join me uh, on the next slide, I think. There we go. Here's the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to sing the first verse of Sent Forth by God's Blessing, number 664. Oh, 
sin for God and for all. God's grace did invite us, and love shall unite us to work for God's kingdom and answer the call.